the subject in him. Uh, the presentation explains rational emotive behavior therapy, REBT, and how it applies to an aging population. REBT deals with the irrational beliefs which are responsible for much of our stress and anxiety. Recognizing them for what they are and learning to dispute them greatly enhances our quality of life. So he's going to tell us how to do it. He moved to Lakeside with his wife, Gethin, in May of 2010. He's currently working on a book called Powerless No Longer, which examines addiction and recovery from the standpoint of neuroplasticity of the brain. He is a certified facilitator for SMART recovery, which uses RB, REBT in the treatment of addiction. Please welcome Pete Soderman. Good morning. Boy, that's a little loud, isn't it? Jim Spivey likes his presenters to be here about an hour early so that he knows he doesn't have to make an emergency phone call. So when I got here early this morning and saw all these chairs set up, I said, my goodness, are they expecting Mick Jagger or what? <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, somebody actually came here to hear me. That's quite a challenge. Most people just come here to, because it's a social thing. The meditation. I was almost ready to jump into my talk. I forgot that Jim asked me to do the meditation. It's a little technique I use to kind of get grounded and centered either at the beginning of my day or, or during the day if it's a busy day. Make yourself comfortable. Put your feet flat on the floor if you can. Arrange your arms in a comfortable manner. Either close your eyes or just let your eyes focus where they will. Breathe normally in and out. Focus on your breath. Count your breath. In one, out two. Count to ten and start over. Thoughts will come and go. Acknowledge them. Bring yourself gently back to the breath. Do not admonish yourself for the thoughts. Just bring yourself back gently. Feel your chest rise and fall. Notice the sensations in your body. Acknowledge them. Bring yourself back gently to the breath. Okay, now you can bring yourself all the way back. I don't want to put you to sleep before I even get started. That's just, and there's many of, many of you here today, I'm sure, who know much more uh, about meditation than I do. That's just a simple Buddhist meditation that anyone can do to kind of bring yourself back to a centered place. Bring yourself back into the moment. That has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today, but uh, it seemed like a, uh, a good place to start when Jim asked me to do the meditation. 
Last time I was here, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, I gave a talk here on neuroplasticity. That is the characteristic of our, our brain uh, that allows it to reorganize itself functionally and organizationally as a result of uh, our experiences and learning. Uh, near the end of that talk, I discussed a couple of ways uh, where you could take advantage of that characteristic uh, to make changes in your life. Okay. This talk is going to focus upon actually using a specific technique that takes advantage of the characteristic of neuroplasticity in order to relieve some of the suffering that we bring upon ourselves due to some of the beliefs that we carry. There's a an old Buddhist legend, legend uh, probably false, but uh, a man came to the Buddha one day and said, Master, I need you to help me with my problems. I have all these problems. And he started to go through the entire litany. His children, his job, his uh, finances, uh, the, list, the list went on and on and on. Uh, of all the problems that the man had. And he got to the end of the list, and, and the Buddha held up his hand, and he said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. The man looked at the Buddha and said, but you, Master, you're a great teacher. You're known far and wide for helping people who are suffering and so on. Uh, what do you mean you can't help me with my problems? And the Buddha said, look around. Look around you. We all have problems. In fact, we all have exactly 43 problems. And it doesn't do any good to solve them. Because as quick as you solve one, another one pops up somewhere else. But we keep the same number of problems. So I can't help you solve your problems. And the man was very discouraged. He turned around and started walking away. The Buddha said, wait a minute. He said, I can help you with your 44th problem. And the man said, what are you talking about? He said, you just told me that we all had only 43 problems. He said, well, your 44th problem <clears throat> is that you don't want to have any problems. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's what we're going to talk about today, the 44th problem. Uh, because none of us want problems, none of us want hassle. We've all developed beliefs and belief systems about things, uh, some of which are irrational. And these irrational beliefs, when we have them, cause us to suffer. Suffering isn't really the word that I prefer to use. The Buddhists have a better word. It's dukkha, which is often translated as suffering, but that not really the same thing. Dukkha is being separated from that which we like, or being forced to endure that which we do not like. It's a stress, anxiety, dissatisfaction. The world or reality doesn't meet our expectations. It's a disquietude. Well, it's a funny thing about reality. The best definition of reality uh, was written by one of my favorite authors, Philip K. Dick, uh, who said, reality is that which doesn't go away when you stop believing in it. Reality doesn't give a darn about our beliefs. It is what it is. Okay? We can't change uh, reality, or most of it. Things happen. The only thing we can change are our beliefs about reality and our perceptions of reality that we have 
at least some control over. In my earlier talk, I touched on the subject of rational emotive behavior therapy, or REBT. Uh, it's a subset of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, in fact, it was one of the first cognitive behavioral therapies. It was developed, <coughs> excuse me, it was developed uh, by Dr. Albert Ellis in the mid-50s. Uh, it's well-established. Uh, uh, it's a well-established therapy. Uh, a lot of research has been done upon it. It's very efficacious. And it's used by therapists all over the world to treat such things as depression, anxiety, anger management, addiction, uh, OCD, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, I became involved with REBT when I became involved with Smart Recovery, uh, a secular uh, addiction recovery program that uses REBT uh, as a tool uh, to treat addiction. So I had to, uh, of course, learn a good deal about it. I'm not a therapist, okay? Let me say that from the beginning. And if you come up to me after the talk and say, gee, if I practice these things, can I stop taking my meds and seeing my therapist? I'm not going to answer the question. Uh, I'm not here to do that. Uh, I'm here just to present some ideas that may or may, you may or not, may not think apply to you. If they do, fine. If they don't, fine. Uh, okay. Ellis believed that we're not only upset by events that happen, they're not the primary thing that upsets us. Our upsetness is caused by our views of reality, the language we use, the way our belief systems function, our and our philosophies about the world and others. We weren't born with our belief systems. These are something that we develop over time as a result of our experiences, starting from early as childhood. Very often, we don't examine our belief systems. They are what they are. Something happens, and we it triggers a certain belief, and we act a certain way. And very often, we never challenge that belief or think about it. Because it's part of our habit memory. Something happens, and we, uh, we react. We act as we feel, and we feel as we think. Therefore, we act as we think. If we can change our thoughts or our beliefs, we can change our actions and how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people. REBT looks at, looks at uh, the process this way. A is an activating event. It's not the real problem. It's, it can be something that's internal or external. It can be a thought or any event in the past, present, or future. You know, we can be worrying about something that triggers a certain belief and, and causes us to feel in a certain manner. B is our belief about the A. If our belief about the activating event is dysfunctional or irrational, the consequence, which is C, is likely to be self-defeating and destructive. I'm going to get plenty of examples of these as I go along. And there's no test at the end either, by the way. The consequence, C, are the self-defeating behaviors, 
I was talking about anger, resentment, letting other people rent space in our heads. The he, he said, she said conversations that we have in our heads before or after uh, uh, real events. Uh, depression, anxiety, uh, self-blame, self-pity, uh, hurt, guilt, and shame. These are all consequences of our own <coughs> belief systems. D is the dispute of the belief, okay, which we first must recognize as being irrational, which means we must examine it. Not an easy thing to do when we're normally used to A, something happens, B, it triggers a relief, relief uh, a belief, and C, there's a consequence. Well, in there someplace, we have to examine that belief. We have to stop and say, wait a minute, is that belief rational? And that's the technique I'm, I'm going to talk about. E, <clears throat> the E part, uh, way down at the bottom here, is the new consequence as a result of the new belief. And hopefully, <clears throat> it's, it's a better outcome. One last Zen story I want to tell. Uh, if I was to sum up this whole talk with one story, it would be this. It's not really a story, it's more of a scene. I have lost my favorite teacup. Now, I have, I can have lost my favorite teacup and be absolutely miserable. I can beat myself up over it. I can, I can call myself a fool. I can uh, thrash myself thoroughly about losing the teacup. I can do all those things. That's the choice I have. Or I can have lost my favorite teacup and be okay with it. Okay? Get another teacup and move on. Either way, either way, the teacup is gone. Okay, the reality is the teacup is gone. My choice is what I want to believe about that. Do I want to go, be okay with it and go on? Or do I want to sit there and do about it? That's the choice I have. Dr. Ellis identified three core irrational beliefs that he found among the people he was dealing with. Three that are core, and all the rest that I'm going to talk about are derivatives from them. The language that's used in these beliefs is pretty harsh. Think about the language that we use when we talk to ourselves inside our heads. The language we use toward ourselves and others, what we call ourselves, what we call other people, not necessarily that we express, but what goes on inside our head, which is where the upsetness is. These are in no particular order. The first one is I absolutely must perform well. If I fail, I am an unworthy and ina inadequate person who will probably always fail. And therefore, I deserve to suffer. The second, you absolutely must treat me kindly and fairly under practically all conditions, or you are an unworthy and horrible person who will always treat me badly, and you should be severely punished. And the third is the conditions under which I live must absolutely be comfortable or life is awful, I can't bear it, and life is hardly worth living. Those are the three core beliefs. The common word in all three is must. 
must, an absolute word that we use all the time to ourselves and to other people. We call that masturbation in our ABT. <laughs> the shoulda, woulda, coulda. Okay, the things we beat ourselves up for all the time. Disputing the irrational beliefs will eventually change the beliefs themselves. This is exactly how I recovered and millions of other people have recovered from addiction. By unplugging the cues and the triggers and changing belief systems about the world, about others, uh, and about the real meaning uh, of events. In 2001, Dr. Ellis wrote a book, one of, one of many, in fact, I think it was one of his last ones, called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, Overcoming Destructive Beliefs, Feelings, and Behaviors. In that book, he devoted a couple of chapters to, specifically to, irrational beliefs that he found among his aging patients. There's just not a better way to say that. I mean, you, you know, we're all living here in the retirement community. We're a bunch of expats down here. We're an aging population. And there's a, there are a number of these irrational beliefs that are common to people in our situation and, and, and time of life. That's what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk. Uh, there's three categories of them. Uh, the first are self-downing or self-deprecating beliefs. The second category is those that, are those that create anger. And the third category are those that create frustration. I'm going to go through the beliefs. I'm going to kind of list them. And after that, I'm going to give a couple of examples, at least, on how to go about disputing them. How do you do that in your head? You know, how, how do you go through a procedure like this in your head? Well, it's, it's pretty intuitive once you start doing it. But picking it up from scratch is, is, is a little bit difficult. First, the self-deprecating beliefs. I must do as well as I previously did when I was younger and more able, or else I am an inadequate person. I must be younger and more attractive than I am. I must not be physically weak and deficient. I should have accomplished more than I did during my life. That's a big one for me. Oh, there's a couple of these that are, that are big ones for me. I must not look as anxious or weak as I now do. I must not die and be forgotten. These are those that create anger. Other people must treat me kindly and fairly, especially because of my age and the limitations and disabilities that go with it. When they treat me badly, they are rotten people. My relatives, children's, children's, children, my relative, my relatives, children, grandchildren, and friends must not neglect me and must treat me as well as they did when I lived closer. Other people should treat me as well as they did when I was younger and more able. People should not discriminate against me or look down upon me because of my age and my weaknesses. And these are the beliefs that bring about frustration. The conditions of my life must be as good as they previously were, and it's awful, and I can't stand it when they aren't. The special problems and difficulties of aging should not should not exist, and it's too hard to live with them. 
I need more pleasure and excitement, and life is too boring without it. I need more companionship and love, especially from those I care for. I should have the help I used to have and not be ill or disabled. I should not have to be as dependent upon others as I am now. I should not have to die and be deprived of life. Okay. Those are the beliefs that can create frustration. By the way, um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, I created a little handout for this. If anyone is interested, there are a few copies around by the board, by the tree, uh, that has most of this talk in it in very capsule form. Uh, you're welcome to it. My email address is pete at gmail.com. Email if there's no more available there. Um, now, I'm disputing these irrational beliefs. In the, first, in the first place, these irrational beliefs are very strong. As I mentioned, most of the time we never even consider considering them. We don't look at our beliefs. We seldom, well, I won't say we don't, we seldom examine our beliefs in the light of rationality. We just don't do it. You know, these are, their, these are our beliefs, these are part of who we are. Well, do we ever look at whether or not these beliefs are harmful, whether or not they're true, okay? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to examine these rational beliefs from several different standpoints. Uh, but remember that they've developed very strong neural pathways. Those of you who heard my last talk on neuroplasticity, uh, I'm sure that you'll all remember that beliefs that are emotional, beliefs that are emotional, that are triggered by the limbic system, are the strongest of all. And they can cause us to do things without examining them uh, any time. There are three basic strategies for disputing these irrational beliefs. First, there's the empirical or scientific dispute. Then there's the functional dispute. And lastly, the logical dispute. From the standpoint of the functional dispute, that means looking at the, at the irrational belief uh, well, wait a minute, I just wondered that. Turn the page to see. From the standpoint of the empirical dispute, we're looking for where is the proof? Where is the proof that this belief is true? We're looking for evidence of the validity of the belief. The second dispute, which is the functional dispute, is my irrational belief helping me, or is it making things worse for me? Does this belief work to help me achieve my goals or not? Does it help me be happier or more upset? Very simple question. And the logical dispute, is this belief logical? Does it ring true to my common sense? In this case, we're looking for ways that this belief does not stem from our preferences for love and approval, comfort and success, or achievement. Does this belief blow things out of proportion, or does it overgeneralize? That's the logical dispute. Now, a couple of examples. Take the, take the, the belief, I must do as well as I previously did when I was younger and more able, or I am an inadequate person. From the empirical standpoint, let's look at the first part of that belief. Where is the evidence that older people must 
do as well as they did when they were younger and more able. I play softball once or twice a week with a, with a bunch of guys who pick up games down at the lower soccer field over here. Uh, Monday mornings and Friday mornings is at uh, 9.30 if anybody's interested. Uh, when I first started playing down there, I discovered something. There were some things that I did in my 20s and 30s that I couldn't do anymore. Okay? And for a while, I beat myself up over it. I'm human like everybody else. Where is the evidence that I must uh, be as, <coughs> do as well as I did when I was younger? There is none. In fact, there's a whole lot of evidence that's contrary to that. I'm 66 years old. I've had two knee operations. I've, I've got arthritis in both knees. Uh, my uh, uh, reflexes certainly aren't as good as they were in my 20s and 30s. So there's plenty of evidence that I should not be able to do as well as I once did. And the second part, where is the evidence where is the evidence that failure to do as well as I used to do makes me totally inadequate? Totally inadequate. Well, just because I can't catch this fly ball, maybe I can catch the next one. You know, if I can't hit this pitch, maybe I can hit the next one. I can still contribute. I can still have fun, which is the bottom line purpose of the exercise anyway, isn't it? Okay. From a functional standpoint, ask yourself what results will you achieve if you command you must do as well as you once did. I can tell you from experience, it's not pleasant. Okay, uh, you can send you, you can uh, absolutely kill yourself with the, you can actually absolutely drive yourself down the down the toilet. Uh, it's not a healthy belief. Will it, will, it, will it raise or lower my self-esteem if I command that I must do as well? From a logical standpoint, question whether you will always perform poorly. And will you truly be an inadequate person if you sometimes or often do? Uh, it's part of what I said above. There's no evidence that I'll always do poorly. Uh, another irrational belief the conditions of my life must be as good as they previously were, and it's awful, and I can't stand it when they aren't. From the empirical side, where is the evidence that the conditions of your life must be, must be as good as they were? We have all chosen to live in a situation that's full of inconveniences down here, okay? Money won't necessarily solve all the problems that we have down here. Uh, we simply are not as competent in some ways as we used to be in dealing with things. Um, from a functional standpoint, this is a belief that can do us nothing but harm. The reality here is what it is. Uh, the, we have no choice other than to stand it. And, well, we can leave. But I guarantee you, you'll have the same 43 problems anywhere else. Uh, and you won't have this pleasant weather. <laughs> From a logical standpoint, that belief doesn't doesn't ring true either, uh, for the reasons I already said. Uh, what can you do other than stand it? This is the language that we use in our own heads that causes us the kinds of problems uh, that that we're addressing today. Uh, 
and its own belief system. There are some other techniques in REDP beyond disputing irrational beliefs that also bear on, on uh, the suffering we cause ourselves. And one is unconditional, unconditional self-acceptance. Try saying to yourself, I accept myself because I'm alive today and have the capacity to enjoy my existence. I am not my behavior. I am not my behavior. I am a combination of many traits. And examining and exaggerating any one of them will cause me more harm than good. Try thinking about self-worth not being a variable. And that's a new concept, perhaps, to some of you. Our self-worth goes up and down, depending on what we do, how, we, how the day is going, this and that. Uh, we, can, we can see ourselves as inadequate. We can see ourselves as uh, other than the people of worth that we are. If you consider that self-worth is a variable, one of the consequences of that is that it involves that you choose one of your traits to rate. The only way you can rate a trait like that is relatively, which means you have to rate it against another person. And we shouldn't be rating other people anyway. So try thinking of self-worth not being a variable that goes up and down like an elevator. I accept myself because I'm alive, alive today. Very important to look at our vocabulary. Not only the kind of words we say out loud, but the kind of words we say inside our head to ourselves. Instead of thinking must, how about prefer? Instead of should, how about it is desirable? Instead of have to, how about choose to? I need, I want, or I prefer. Instead of never, the word I use a lot in my head, I'll never do that. Rarely is a much healthier word to use, perhaps. Instead of always, how about often? Instead of awful, how about highly undesirable? Instead of bad person, how about bad behavior? Okay. Some examples are, instead of I am a failure, how about I fail at? We all fail at something, okay? Doesn't mean you're a failure, it means you didn't do that that time. Instead of I have to do well, how about I want to do well? You shouldn't do that. I prefer you not do that. You never help me. You rarely help me. I'm a loser. I failed at this one task. That's what I have today. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention, and if there's any questions, uh, I'll be happy to address them. Again, if there's no more of the handouts available back up there, I have a few, uh, and, or you can get in touch with me by email at pete at gmail.com.
Okay, uh, do we have questions? How many of you have heard of uh, this Albert Ellis and this type of cognitive behavior therapy? That's a good bit. And um, how many people have have used the REBT? Oh, good. There's so. Any any um, comments or questions from people that was it was it something valuable to you? Those who. Um, Good. Uh, we have a comment or question here. Okay. If we do these things, try to do how long does it take before you know that no any changes? No, actually, actually what happens is that the changing of these beliefs, okay, you've got to remember they're deeply ingrained. In many cases, uh, I'm sure a lot of the guys here will, will, will relate to this, I hear my father's voice a lot, okay? You'll never be any good, you'll never do this, you'll never do that. Uh, it doesn't bother me anymore, but it certainly did at one time, okay? Um, the practice of these, in order to remove deeply ingrained programming, which is what we're doing, the brain is capable of rewiring itself, but it takes practice. And the, the trick is not to beat yourself when you fail to do it. In other words, damn, I'm still thinking that way, and damn, by now I should be doing better, and, and so on. It's a gradual process. It's very much, you know, one shot at a time. The trick is to be aware of what's going on in our head, okay? Uh, and it's the same when, when I work with, with, uh, with addicts. Uh, you have to see the behavior. You have to realize that it's going on. Uh, in order to uh, dispute the belief and, and do something about it. So it's an awareness thing, okay? Uh, and it's making yourself aware of it. Anyone else? Um, good. It seems to me that when you lose your favorite coffee mug, you have three choices. You can do something about it. Or you can just beat yourself up and fret, fret, fret. Or you can let go of it. Pete, did I understand you to say that you work with people with addictive behavior and the smart therapy? Or would you explain a little bit more about smart therapy? Well, it's, it's smart as is, smart is a um, uh, acronym. <laughs> it's an acronym, yeah, for uh, self-management and recovery training. Uh, it's a support group with some 250 face-to-face -face meetings in the United States and other countries. Um, I was a facilitator and started a smart group in Wilmington, North Carolina. And, uh, uh, with quite a few years there with it. It was my intention to, be, to start a smart group when I moved down here. Uh, then I got started on my book and got off on some other things. And I believe I'm coming back to it, but, but uh, uh, that's, that's basically it. Uh, I noticed the title of your book was interesting. Would you explain why you chose that title and what it is? <laughs> The, the title is, the working title is Powerless No Longer, okay? Uh, SMART is a program, at, although the book is broader in scope than SMART Recovery itself, uh, SMART is a program that emphasizes empowerment 
rather empowering the addict. You have the power. Uh, in our judgment, in my judgment, the worst thing you can tell an addict uh, is that he's powerless over his addiction. Okay? Uh, that leads to all sorts of problems. Uh, not only labeling, but, uh, uh, you know, if you don't have the power and can't get the power, then, then you're kind of stuck. So, uh, self-management and recovery training is based on, based upon the empowering the addict. And you can, you can rewire those things, okay? You, you can change your belief system. You change your belief system, you can change your behaviors. Uh, and it's a very successful program. Typically, people stay in smart recovery for anywhere from 12 to 18 months and then move on with their lives. But there's a question that's back here. Okay, I have one question. I understand the irrational inquiry you're going to change something. But if there's something in your head that you think is actually valid, a belief that you hold, but it causes you great grief. What are you supposed to do? A belief that you hold that's valid, but it causes you great grief. Well, you know, there's numbers. Honestly, well, you know, everything people, you know, we prefer people who don't lie or you know, have honesty. But what if you don't have the honesty? In other words, it causes you. Uh, grief when other people lie. Okay. Uh, I, I think there's nothing wrong with it with a belief that, that uh, honesty is the best policy. Uh, I don't think that's an invalid or irrational belief at all. But when we hold others to our own standards, that's where we can get into trouble sometimes. Perhaps uh, I, I think that I'd look at uh, is it, I realize that this person does this occasionally. No, not occasionally. That's one of this person's characteristics. But this person has other characteristics that balance those out. And the overall package is a person I like. Even though she has this, this one thing. Um, I don't know, that's the, that's the way I look at it. Can we have one here? That's it, exactly. <laughs> our best friend case. When we hold other people to our standards. And I would like to say that one of the great benefits of living in Ahi in New Mexico is they revere older people. And I asked a young Mexican woman, why is that? And she said, because we know we will grow old someday. And I said, why would they get that up in the States? <laughs> but I think you touched on something that's so important is the whole actual full realization of aging. And I would also appreciate if you would be willing to discuss for one minute suicide. In what context? I, I mean, that's, uh, there are a couple of different ways to look at that in an aging population. One can be a person who's tired of it all, okay? Uh, I, I think that my own personal feeling is that uh, a decision like that is a very, very personal thing. Okay. Uh, that is to say, it is if it's a person of quote unquote sound mind. I, th I think a person of sound mind can come to a decision like that uh, based on other circumstances, a terminal illness, uh, unbearable pain that's 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 untreatable, you know, things of that nature. Uh, I, I think that's a very personal decision. Does that get to what you wanted, or? 
But in the States, we have the Hemlock Society. And I know a woman who helped her husband die. He begged her. Now, most people, if you speak, even speak of that, they will not continue the conversation. And yet there are many people who say, well, when it gets really bad, I'm going to do something about it. But they don't. Because the whole package is, is still worth another day. Uh, I, I have nothing. I, I have uh, uh, nothing but, but good wishes and good feelings about, for instance, Dr. Kevorkian. Uh, and, and people who will help with, with something like that. When it's a person's decision, then they're sound, sound mind, okay? Uh, it's a very personal thing. Um, I think, there was, was there somebody in this area that had a, had a hand up earlier? Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, just one comment. I think that uh, Switzerland is the only country I know of that you can choose to go to and um, effectively they, they have uh, facilities that will help you to terminate your life and that's legal there and more and more people seem to be going to Switzerland for that purpose now. One, one more question. Yeah. I missed part one, so I've got part three today. When are we going to have part three? <laughs> well, there, there are a bunch of parts. Well, by the way, if you'd like the first talk, I'm sure Roy, our cameraman here, will be happy to sell you a copy uh, of, of my first talk. Uh, I don't plan a part three. My plan has been uh, when my book is done. Uh, and I have something in my hand to talk about, to come back and talk about it to those who are interested. Um, if anyone has any suggestions for a part three along these lines, send me an email. I'll send a proposal to Jim and see if he gives me another shot. So. Well, everybody liked you, so that's a good start. <laughs> Thank you very much for really Um, Do you know where those pamphlets just are? Just a, a quick word before everybody oh, yeah, gets man. moving around. I want to tell you about our next week's speaker, um, Bob Branson, and the title is Managing Personal Change. Beliefs and things you learn today may be helpful in that. During the last four years, 40 years, many researchers investigated personal change. The talk is based on this research. It will discuss the procedures that help many people make these changes. Sponsored by the National Institute of Health, these scientists worked on health issues, smoking, obesity, diabetes management, and healthier lifestyles. Hold on, hold on to talking just a minute, please. Um, Robert Branson is pro Professor Emeritus at Florida State University, where he focused on designing learning systems for organizations, including the U.S. Army the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, American Express, and the General Electric Company. He received his PhD from Ohio State in Experimental Psychology. Remember to turn your cell phones back up, back home, and to pick up your coffee cups and trash. Put it in the trash can, stack the chairs, if you will. Hope to see you next week. <laughs>